and I'm very happy to be here and also meet old colleague students from that time ago. And this is a topic, um, I think I never gave a presentation on that, and it was, but somehow it was fun to, to think about it and what discussion we had 40 years ago and also at the census in 87, um, how naive um, um, many people were at that time and what we have learned afterwards. So, yeah, first about the census. Um, so probably those that are 55 plus might remember that, and, but most are probably younger, um, but maybe have, probably have heard about it. So we had um, yeah, the first try of um, a census in 1983. Um, where the plan was to have a big uh, survey, statistical survey of the population. And um, yeah, this resulted in a privacy debate, especially um, yeah, after the Second World War, many people were afraid that the government could create a big database with information about all citizens and this could potentially be misused for different purposes. And in 1983, when the government first tried to conduct the census, um, there were actually a group of um, citizens going to the constitutional court and compiled complaint. And these were actually two lawyers from Hamburg, Gisela Wild and um, the lawyer Stadler Euler, so two females. And then there was a group of three professors, Steinmüller, Brunstein Pottlich, so Steinmüller from Bremen, um, law professor Klaus Brunstein already mentioned here from Hamburg, computer science, and Potlech, I think was also computer science from Darmstadt. And um, yeah, so they filed complaint because they thought that, um, or claimed that their constitutional rights would, would be violated, that um, the census would violate um, privacy, which could be and the right to informational self-determination, how Steinmüller, Brunstein, Pottlecht also defined it in their complaint. And um, actually they were successful. So the Constitutional Court declared the census as non-constitutional, especially as, it, um, as the plan was that the results of the census should be used as well to update the citizens' registers um, yeah, Einwohnermelder, um, Amt, um, databases. And this was seen as a um, use for another purpose and a purpose misuse, so that actually the government wanted to collect data for statistical purposes, but then suddenly the data is also used to update the registries and um, this, there could be also negative consequences for the citizens if there were mistakes that they um, and could be made responsible, so there was somehow the use of data for different, for another purpose than actually um, what should be the main purpose. And that was also one main reason why um, the census was declared as unconstitutional. But then there were a lot of basic principles that were quite um, important and also worldwide internationally. Uh, much cited, like uh, that now the right to informational self-determination was defined as derived from two articles from the German constitution, the right to human dignity, Article 1, and the right to uh, self-determination, Article 2. So it's not directly written in the constitution that you have a right to informational self-determination, but it was defined that it could be derived and that this is also a basic right of individuals. Um, yes, yeah, secondly, what I think is very important is also that they um, very clearly stated that there are no non-sensitive data. So all data can be sensitive, it always depends on the purpose, and that's why also purpose binding and purpose limitation as a principle is very important. Like, um, yeah, if you have medical records, if you use it for treatment purposes, it has another sensitivity as if um, your employer or your Insurance uses it for other purposes, so it is very important to also limit the purpose of data. And um, 
Yeah, and that you can never say that data are non-sensitive. All data can become sensitive. It always depends on context and purpose. So that was also um, nicely stated um, very explicitly in the decision. And then uh, thirdly, what I think is also very important, privacy is not only a right of the individuals, but also imp important for democracy and for society as a whole. So that is also very important that um, they stated that in a society where every citizen can be permanently monitored, um, this would have impact because then people would not behave freely. They would, for instance, not go to political uh, meetings or demonstrations because they could be afraid that uh, this could have implications and then also democracy which depends on everybody freely contributing with, um, with their opinions would be impacted and that's, um, yeah, so it's not only important for the individuals but for society democracy as a whole so that was also explicitly stated and then finally it was required that um, the data should be effectively anonymized, uh, faktische anonymisierung, and um, this also led then to uh, another debate in the census that was then planned in 1987 when the government tried to address some of the issues and now came up with a new plan to launch the census. And um, yeah, at that time, I was a student at Hamburg University. Actually, I started in 82, so already in 83, I was a student and was in seminars with Klaus Bronstein, and this was a big topic when, it, um, when he was successful with his, um, with his um, um, complaint to the Constitutional Court. But then in 86, I started to write my bachelor thesis with him. He had the idea to show that the census data are actually not anonymized, so the Constitutional Court required um, effective anonymization, but actually um, from the data collected, only the name was deleted and the address was replaced by, with a um, yeah, more coarse-grained um, address information. Um, so it was only formally anonymized, if you can say it, that the name was taken away. Um, but somehow it was claimed this is anonymous. And um, yeah, the idea was to show how easily it is to identify everybody. So um, I just then did a simulation model where I created 100,000 records representing uh, the Hamburg population based on statistics that were published. And then we could show that with very little information like age, um, profession, yeah, maybe um, um, service status, you could identify everybody easily. So this is nowadays not very surprising, but at that time it was um, somehow, um, yeah, for many people, um, yeah, big news and surprising. So um, unexpectedly it was in many uh, newspapers. I think first the Tats um, published is then Spiegel and then and Stern and, and on TV stations so somehow that the data is not anonymous um, was somehow very surprising for everybody while nowadays I think it is very um, simple facts so that was interesting and then we also in my master's thesis I also worked on how existing databases could be used for statistics as an alternative to a census in a privacy preserving manner that you could um, use it um, um, or statistically or derive statistics that cannot be correlated to identify people because statistics as such are not anonymous either because if you correlate different statistics you could usually uh, still come back to individuals and so we so um, we had uh, yeah so that was another investigation but um, yeah I think most interestingly um, that it was big news that the data is not anonymous. It ended in, a, um, in parallel, there was also a big um, debate, boycott um, also of political parties, the Green Party, um, the um, Jusos, the young um, social democrats um, boycotted the census with other um, organizations and um, yeah, probably 10 or 20% in the end didn't fill in the forms even 
so um, they had to pay fines or even go to prison for some days. Um, yeah, anyhow, um, soon after there was a reunification and all the data was probably useless, but I guess even because of the boycott, it was probably useless, but somehow it was also some political power between the parties that uh, during the coal government that um, resulted that anyhow, um, yeah, the, consent, the census was conducted. Um, yeah, so what did we learn from them, from then? So, first of all, um, many of the principles that the Constitutional Court stated um, yeah, have been uh, exemplified um, with different uh, scandals or, or um, research that are also showing. Um, yeah, uh, for instance, that there are no non-sensitive data and privacy is also important for democracy. Yeah, here are some examples, for instance, in 2012, um, researchers also showed that just if you analyze how people click the um, Facebook like button, you can derive very sensitive information about individuals, including information about um, their um, uh, sexual orientation, ethnicity, religion, political um, views, personality traits, intelligence, happiness, use of addictive substances, parental separation, age and gender, so a lot of information that maybe the individual might not even um, be aware of, what is your personality, what is your intelligence. Um, so um, with big data analysis, and now, now that is also now more than 10 years ago with artificial intelligence, it's even more easy, easier to derive very sensitive information from very little data. So it really shows that data uh, can be processed in ways that um, even if maybe data items like, like how you click um, like buttons per se, um, users do not think that is very sensitive, but then it can have huge implications. And yeah, another scandal that you probably Still remember is also Cambridge Analytica that got data from Facebook users about their profiles. Also some kind of personality test that they did where the users um, believed the data would be kept confidential, but they were anyhow given to Cambridge Analytica that analyzed the data and then the results were used in the US American elections and also helped the Republicans to address potential voters during the election where Trump was finally winning. So you can see also other examples how privacy, that demonstrate how important privacy is actually for democracy. Then, um, yeah, secondly, deletion of directly identifiable well, data is not anonymization, so even if you try to anonymize the data, it is very likely that it is not anonymous in the end. Re-identification is always easily possible. So Latanya Sweeney actually showed very similar results as we did for the German census. So for, she used the 1990 US census data to formally show that 87% of the US population can be uniquely identified just with the gender, zip code, and full date of birth. So, yeah, no surprise. But, um, yeah, 15 years ago, still people, yeah, there were some data breaches because companies were um, still not fully understanding that yeah, just by deleting names or other directly identifiable data, you could anonymize data. So maybe you have heard about the AOL, American Online Incident. So they, in 2006, published a data set with search queries from at about 650,000 users. So they just deleted the name or replaced it with a unique number and were assuming that it was, would be anonymous. And, but then you had very um, sensitive profiles of different searches. And um, yeah, at that time, a reporter from New York Times 
um, try to track down um, yeah, one individual that they selected under a certain number. Um, so, and then um, looked at the search queries, which included topics like um, uh, 60 single men, numb fingers, and um, dogs that urinate on everything, so a lot of different um, search strings. And they also succeeded finally to track down this individual under the number 4417749, and that was Selma Arnold. Um, yeah, she was also surprised that suddenly the reporters visited her, and, but she agreed also to publish her story. So, of course, if you have a, a profile of different search queries, very detailed, uh, with some additional knowledge, it's very easy to identify these people. So, yeah, America Online also had to take down this database and apologize. Similar thing happened with Netflix in the same year. They also released... Uh, 100 million ratings from uh, 480,000 users and claimed that the data would be anonymous because they removed the names, but then other researchers showed that you, if you match one data set with another data set, it is still very easy to identify everybody. So they took another film rating database, EMDB database, and yeah, it, um, it, was, um, it could be calculated that Netflix data, that for Netflix data, no two um, records are similar more with more than 50% of the data. So that means also if the profile can be matched to up to 50% similarity to the profiles in that other database, IMDB, then the adversary can identify the profile with a good likelihood. So they could also show that um, just by matching the Netflix database with another database, they could identify, um, yeah, um, most users. So another uh, data breach because well, the companies didn't understand that um, anonymization is much more difficult at that time. Then there were other findings that and came up. Um, yeah, you probably also heard about um, browser um, fingerprinting. Um, so here uh, via the version and configuration information in the browser. Um, this was also published in uh, 2010 that uh, more than 94% of browsers with Flash and Java, for instance, could be, um, the users could be uniquely identified in the experiments. So that's when you use, for instance, the Tor browser you also should not change the window size. It comes with a standard window size um, because otherwise you would leak some personal data. So these are all examples which um, shows also how the understanding of anonymity and anonymization has um, changed over the last 40 years. So at 40 years ago, I think many were very naive, but still 15 years ago, um, a lot of knowledge lacked, and I think nowadays we understand that anonymization is hardly possible. Um, or you, you can anonymize, but it will not result in anonymous data. Also, another interesting uh, quote is here, because at the census, the um, census offer, as uh, this uh, German census office, the Statistical Bundesamt, when we discussed our findings with them, they said, okay, you can easily identify, but the data is at the mainframe, um, kept at um, the government authorities and handled by German civil, yeah, um, civil servants, and they are not criminals, so they will not re-identify, so it is anonymous. And yeah, so Klaus Bonstein, <laughs> he's laughing, yeah. that's a joke. Um, yeah, of course, German civil servants are not criminal, uh, have no criminal energy because uh, he is also a civil servant and they don't have energy at all, so he <laughs> <laughs> fully believes that. <laughs> but yeah, anyhow, somehow that were the arguments. And here it's interesting that also the Article 29 Data Protection Working Party, so it is a party of all European data protection officers, um, 
in 2014, also the statement on anonymization techniques and also clearly stated that anonymization um, means that data must be processed in such a way that it can no longer be used to identify a natural person by using all means likely reasonably to be used by either the controller or a third party. So also insiders should not be able to re-identify, not only outsiders. So I think this is also very important that this was then clearly stated because somehow the debate uh, 40 years ago were differently at least. And you talked with stat people from the Statistical Bundesamt. Yeah, so then, um, yeah, I also want briefly to discuss um, also the areas of privacy enhancing technologies have uh, progressed as an enabler for different solutions to conduct a census or statistical analysis in a privacy preserving manner. Still there are challenges, so in, yeah, um, this is also now um, probably 20 years ago, um, K-anonymity was defined as a measure, but actually this um, is quite straightforward by Latanya Sweeney and Piangela Samarati. So when can, can you talk about anonymity? So it's not enough to only delete the names. You should, at, uh, you have K-anonymity if each value combination of the quasi-identifiers of the demographic da data occurs at least K times, so you should not have any uniquely identifiable records. So different records um, should, uh, there should be, for instance, if you have two, uh, yeah, K anonymity for K equal two, at least two records in a database that have the same values of the quasi-identifiers that you are evaluating, like, yeah, like here you, um, here it is not the case, here you, users are uniquely identifiable by birth date or in combination with zip code for instance, like the first one, but then with um, suppression or generalization, you could try to anonymize the database so that you have at least always, oops, not a good idea, at least uh, two records that have the same value combinations. Um, yeah, but still, this might not be enough. So for instance, even so the first two records in the right database have the same now birth date, um, uh, civil, um, yeah, gender, civil servants, um, then the data that should be um, evaluated, like the diagnosis field. Um, yeah, if both have sensitive diseases, for instance, both have types of cancer, then you could still find out that, um, yeah, that, they, um, that uh, these users have cancer, so you should also com complement it with something like L diversity, so it gets a bit more complex. Another technique that have, has been invented in 2006 is differential privacy, or, uh, or basically the technique to add statistical noise to data to protect it has been known, but um, a concept how you can implement it to have certain privacy guarantees um, was invented in 2006 by Cynthia Drog and has actually been used in 2020 by the US Census for preventing that personal data could be leaked by published statistics. So the, it has been implemented for disclosure avoidance uh, systems. Um, yeah, here I also refer to a scientific paper on how the US census has used differential privacy to protect the statistical data. So we see some ad advan advancements and also more insights um, yeah, in the last years that um, also statistical data could leak personal data and needs to be protected. So differential privacy as said, invented 2006 is a concept um, where you can assure privacy of statistical data, um, yeah, where you have, um, where you can guarantee that if you have two databases that only uh, differ in a single record, like um, 
I'm, my record is in one of the database, but not in the other. If I do statistical analysis, the answers will almost be the same, or will be the same, or almost be the same, so they differ at most by a value epsilon, which should be preferably very small, um, smaller than one. So, um, yeah, so that means if you cannot, um, dis uh, yeah, if you, for the two different um, databases, in one database, uh, my record is included and the others not, I still get the same results. You cannot um, infer any personal information about me. And also, what is guaranteed is plausible deniability. Um, someone would also claim I'm not in the data set because you cannot derive any evidence that someone is in the data set or not. So that is a very nice privacy guarantee which is now used, yeah, as said by the US census, but also by big companies, Google, Apple, Uber, um, for um, statistics. So there can be different um, different types of differential privacy. So for instance, Apple, if you enable on your uh, iPhone stat uh, that statistical analysis is allowed, then you have local differential privacy where statistical noise is directly added on your device before it is sent to Apple. Uh, so Apple can be an untrusted aggregator that then does the statistics. Um, but you can, the classical constellation is that um, uh, users send the raw data and then a trusted curator is adding the statistical noise and the statistics are then released to an untrusted query. So that is, for instance, the example with the US census. Also, um, differential privacy can be used for, um, for, um, for collaborative learning, for, um, where uh, in order to protect um, statistic uh, um, yeah, machine learning models, because from a machine learning model that is trained, you can also derive personal data. For instance, um, um, membership inference can, uh, attacks can be conducted. So if you have trained a statistical model, um, a machine learning model on um, medical diagnosis where different users have contributed to the training with the data, then later it could be found out with um, membership inference attacks, oops, <laughs> who contributed to the, uh, with the data to the statistics and then you could find out that someone has this, uh, for instance, a certain disease. So um, also for machine learning models, differential privacy can be used. Yeah, finally also, a slide we all, um, another shelling which is with differential privacy is also in regard to the usability and understanding. So here we conducted at Karlstadt University with two colleagues a study uh, where we interviewed uh, 30 users, conducted interviews and then analyzed the data for different um, types of differential privacy to find out whether commonly used metaphors for explaining differential privacy is well understood. And we use the metaphor that is also used for the US census with the pixelation of photos, which nicely shows if, that if you add um, noise to the data, like you pixelate the photo more and more, then you get more privacy, but you also lose utility because with differential privacy, you have also a privacy utility trade-off. And um, we uh, analyzed how far users understand um, such metaphors. And interestingly, um, yeah, there were a lot of misconceptions, um, especially users that had some technical background misunderstood differential privacy. For instance, users that were aware of encryption thought that differential privacy works like encryption, we add statistical noise, later you could also remove it, like you could decrypt data. People that were aware of VP, VPNs were thinking it's like selective disclosure, so you will not send, like you don't send your IP address, you will only disclose some data, so there are a lot of misconceptions. Also people thought, um, yeah, if um, 
if you know how differential privacy works, you could reverse the protection. People understood the utility uh, privacy trade-off, but were also thinking much more on the utility loss than on the privacy gain. So our conclusion was that instead of using such metaphors which, which explain how differential privacy work, metaphors should concentrate more on the functionality that is gained, like uh, illustrates the risk reduction that is achieved and also give guidance what this means in a certain context, for instance, whether um, yeah, whether data is now um, safe um, against, uh, yeah, what type of re-identification, is it safe enough to store the data in the cloud, uh, in a non-European cloud and so on, especially after Schrems II um, court decision. Yeah, I have to <laughs> exactly uh, finalize my talk, so I could talk much more about it, but um, just short <laughs> conclusions. Census debate decision, important milestone, lessons learned, anonymized data can never be totally anonymous. So we were very naive 40 years ago that many people were yeah, very much surprised um, by this fact. Pets can minimize risks, but they come with utility tra um, trade-offs and usability challenges. And um, yeah, nowadays in Germany, I understand that the census is used based on existing registers um, together with the sample collections. It is actually what we also suggested in um, 87. Um, yeah, at that time people say, yeah, for this you need uniquely identifiable, um, uh, unique identifiers, like we have it in Sweden, a personal number, and this was in Germany not accepted because it allows to easily profile everybody under a unique number. I think nowadays with artificial intelligence, uh, anyhow, we don't need these numbers to uniquely identify persons. So um, I think we also have to change perspectives here. But yeah, thank you very much. Unfortunately, I'm two minutes over time. <laughs> no. so have a good